Hello and welcome to whatHiFi.com. I'm here today to talk to Peter Como, Director of Acoustic Design at IAG. Originally a hi-fi journalist, he began the Haybrook Company in the late 1970s and had significant success beginning with the famous HB1s, the first product ever to win a What Hi-Fi Product of the Year award three years running. Much more recently, he had a hand in EB Acoustics EB1s before rejoining IAG, which reunited him with Mission as well as putting Quad, Wharfdale, Castle and Audio Lab all under his stewardship. Peter, welcome. Good afternoon. So we'll go right in at the deep end. What makes a good speaker? Well, I guess a lot of people would like me to say a loudspeaker that has a completely flat frequency response and no distortion. And that isn't the be all and end all of loudspeakers, or indeed hi fi, mm -hmm. because the things that we measure are not always the things that we can hear. Mm. For me, what makes a good loudspeaker is one that gets the musical message across. And we've got to remember that hi fi is all about music. And if a loudspeaker or a hi fi system can convey to the listener exactly what the musical performers and therefore the musical performance is doing in terms of the method of communication, then I feel that the product is worth putting on the market. Okay, now obviously, talking of products, you have a number of brands uh, under your control at IAG. Um, and between them, Quad, Wharfdale, Castle, there are some big legacies there. How do you keep Quad, Quad, and keep Wharfdale, Wharfdale, and keep Mission, Mission? The simple answer to this is we ask the customers what they want. Um, I remember talking to Peter Walker about the success of Quad, and he said that the answer when you're designing something is not to design what you want, but to design what the customer wants to buy. Yeah, cool. And if you turn it round and look at it from that point of view, then you start seeing more clearly how the products for each brand fit in. Mm. Now, Recently, uh, one of the things that our readers will be aware of is that you had a hand in the uh, EB Acoustics, uh, the EB1s, particularly their first product. Now, uh, it's an unusual product in some ways in that it's sold only through uh, the net uh, rather than on the high street. Um, but of course, uh, as readers of the magazine will know, it, it's a very impressive product. Uh, tell me a little bit, a bit about how you go about getting such a good performance from a sub 500 pound speaker. Well, that's the key to selling it over the internet, actually, is the only way to achieve that type of performance for sub 500 pounds in that sort of quality, build quality of product with a fully veneered cabinet of very sophisticated um, build method, um, is to sell it direct. And it's uh, a little unfortunate that the customer can't go into a shop and hear it, yeah. Um, on the other hand, you know, it does enable them to buy a very classy product at a much lower price than, than would normally, they'd normally experience on the high street. And was that the intention all the time, even before the product was designed? That was, that, that was, that was the concept of the product, yes. How, how can we make a really, really good performing and, and well-finished speaker um, for sub £500? And that turned out to be the only way to do it. Right, OK. Now... Um, Going back a little bit in time, um, there was a period uh, which I remember well when Mission was growing, going great guns in, uh, in our magazine and, and elsewhere. And products like the 780s uh, and others were consistently winning group tests and awards. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently after that, there was a period where things weren't quite so spectacular. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, could you tell me a little bit, bit about how you see that, what, uh, what kind of went wrong a little in, in that time? Um, I think it probably lost some of its personality. And if you like, this comes back to what we were talking about earlier with, with how do you differentiate between brands. You know, if, if I'm designing loudspeakers for, or, or rather under my stewardship as you put it, um, loudspeakers are being designed for all the brands, how do we end up with, with something which is different? Mm. Um, and as an analogy to that, I could say, well, let's look around us. Um, you know, we're all human beings, but we're all different. We're all made of the same stuff but we all have different personalities. Mm. And the personality of, of hi-fi speakers or hi-fi products comes from not only what they're made from, but also the designer behind them. Mm. Um, and the, the emphasis has therefore got to be on if you're designing for a particular 
type of product in the marketplace. And Mission has always gone for something very sleek, very elegant, um, very slim, um, that fits into the home. The speakers are designed usually to go close to a rear wall. All those things come together in, in terms of how the product will, will sound and how it will perform. Yeah. And I'm not sure when Mission moved, first of all, from the UK to China, that that was understood. Mm. Um, and part of my job coming back to IAG is to pick up from, from where I left off. Yeah, of course. Well, I have a question for you about quad, um, and particularly the, the, the classic electrostatic speakers. Yeah. Um, of course, they've, been different, they've come in different cases and different sort of versions over the years, but the essential design of those speakers has, has changed, as far as I'm aware, very little uh, in, in decades. Now that you have uh, the position you have with regards to that brand, where do you take those now? Would you, uh, would you look at sort of taking those, trying to evolve them? I think you'd be surprised at how much electrostatics have evolved. Um, the, yes, the, certainly the original quad, the, what we now call the ESL57, uh, didn't change in, at all during its manufacturing time. Um, but since the 63, uh, it's gone through several evolutions. And although the basic operating principle, of course, has remained the same, um, a lot of the structures that go into the manufacturing of it and a lot of the engineering that goes on inside has progressed. And we are still carrying on research and development on the electrostatic. It's one of my loves. It's, mm. it, I almost accidentally fell in love with a pair of ESL 57s many, many years ago. Yes. Um, and electrostatics still have a place in my heart. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, some people just call those the best speakers in the world. Mm. Uh, and from a certain point of view, you can, you can easily see why. Mm. I mean, that actually brings me on to something that I find fascinating, which is that going to the other end of the scale with conventional speakers, um, it seems to me that there's one fundamental issue with speaker design, one basic problem, which is integration. You know, when, you, when you're not dealing with speakers like the electrostatics, when you have different drivers made of different materials vibrating differently and you're trying to make a, a mid-range out of that, yeah. um, that seems the biggest problem. Can you just tell me a little bit about, about how you approach that, not uh, in an overall sense, not with a specific brand, but just a, as an overall mm. design point? Well, you're talking, uh, you're talking about really about crossover design, mm. and, and that is the key to the way that we design multi-unit loudspeakers to sound like a, a homogenous, coherent loudspeaker, mm. is good crossover design. And uh, the first speakers that I designed for Haybrook, it took me 18 months to do the crossover design. Mm. Now, thanks to wonderful computer-aided techniques, we can speed that up significantly. That doesn't mean the computer takes over. It just means that the computer can get us to a starting point, which is near perfection, and then we can do the fine-tuning. Just going back in terms of a bit of history, um, as I said before, obviously you, you were uh, a journalist and then a designer and then went back to being a journalist. At what point did you become a designer? What was your background before that in terms of, of actually dealing with the engineering side of stuff? Uh, well, I'm trained as an electrical engineer, yeah. so, so I've got the engineering background. But I thought my, so. <laughs> yeah, my love was always music, and yeah. therefore music, music reproduction in the home was a, was a big part of my life. And I just wanted to make that as, as enjoyable as possible. Um, and so it was out of a passion for enjoying good music in the home that the engineering came up. And um, loudspeaker design came out of the fact that I had an acquaintance come to me and say, why can't I buy a good pair of loudspeakers under 200 pounds? Mm. Um, and I thought, yeah, why can't you? You, know, there ought to, you ought to be able to. And he said, do you think we could design a pair? Uh, and that's how we, uh, we ended up starting a company to make them. Do you think that, uh, that there is uh, an issue with hi-fi, with speakers specifically, that one's taste in music, genre-wise, has an impact on, uh, on what kind of speakers or what kind of hi-fi sounds good? And, and if, if so, what, what is your taste and how do you allow for that when, uh, when you're designing? Um, well, my taste is extremely wide-ranging. I mean, I just enjoy music and I, I don't care what type or anything else it is. If, 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 if I enjoy it, then I enjoy it. Um, as far as, yes, I'd, people do tend to sort of categorise speakers into classical jazz and rock. Mm. And, and I think that's wrong. Um, and it's not the fault of the listeners, it's perhaps the fault of the loudspeaker design. Mm. For me, a good loudspeaker is only a good loudspeaker, as I said, because it gets the musical message across. And it should be able to do that whatever the genre of music. However, you have got one aspect to this, um, which reversing the whole thing 
seems to make sense. And that is, if you go into a recording studio and listen to the way that rock music is mixed, it tends to be mixed on a particular type of loudspeaker. Uh, and perhaps that means that that particular type of loudspeaker might also reproduce it with a slightly different flavour mm. to what I would call a loudspeaker that I regard as more accurate. That's interesting. I mean, I, I've never quite um, understood why um, the, the Yamaha NS10s were for so have been for so long the the, the speaker of choice in recording studios. Um, but they are. I mean, for, how does a speaker designer react to that? Because because in absolute terms, I could probably rattle off any number of speakers that you've designed that I would regard as as better and more transparent and probably better for mixing than an NS10. But still, they are used in the pro side. How do you feel about that? Well, I talked, I actually went to um, Black Barn Studios to talk to the producer there uh, about speakers. Uh, I had the opportunity when I was at Mission to do that. And he was using NS10s, and I asked him directly, you know, why NS10s? And he said, come with me. And we walked into the kitchen, and I realized that he could hear in the kitchen exactly what was going on in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason yeah. for that, when I analysed it, was because the one thing the NS10 has got is an extremely coherent mid-band, and it's very revealing. And it's the frequency extremes which are a bit ragged yes. that, uh, that hi-fi people object to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we ended up actually um, designing a pair of speakers which had that coherent and transparent mid-band, but which also cleaned up the bass and the treble as well, and that, that became the Mission Studio Monitor. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Peter, for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure all of our viewers uh, will be very fascinated in everything you have to say. And to all you guys, thanks for watching, and keep checking back here for lots more news, reviews, how-tos, and interviews right here on whathifi.com.